to you All the glory belongs to you Oh God Oh God Say all of the glory All the glory belongs All of the glory belongs to you Oh God Oh God Help us sing All of the glory Belongs to you Oh Oh, 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 oh,
before the throne of grace and mercy thanking you for this day thanking you for all the many blessings you've seen fit to bestow upon us we thank you for life health and strength we thank you for just being with us heavenly father we ask that you would guide us through this service and and those that are possibly on the way we ask you would grant them safe traveling passage heavenly father these things we ask in your son jesus christ's name let us all say amen So practice you do this.
Let us sing. This life is filled with sorrow and troubles, heavy load. We are made to wonder just why it should be so. In every tribulation, this life must reign. We're singing, oh Lord, we need, we need a friend like you.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we are thankful for this day, thankful for the opportunity to come together through worship and spirit and truth. Father, we ask that you continue to bless us, to strengthen us, and to guide us. Father, help us to show the path of righteousness to those who do not know you. Father, we ask for continued blessings, forgiveness of sins. Father, we ask that you be with the sick and the shut in. Father, we ask that you be with the leaders of this world, that they may do what is right in thy eyesight. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask it all. Amen. Salvation and glory, glory, honor, and power to the Lord our God. For the Lord, for the Lord our God is mighty, and the Lord our God is omnipotent. Salvation, salvation. 
God of heaven above that again we find ourselves on this side of the timeline of life that for whatever reason he chose to do it God has blessed us he has showered us with his love and his grace and his mercy and if you ever want evidence of that fact just consider that for at least one more time one more day one more moment you are among the land of the living, and you are being seen and not being viewed. To those who may be visiting with us this morning on this Resurrection Sunday, whether you're in our digital worship space or whether you're here in our physical location, we extend to you a warm welcome. We're so glad that you've come to be with us at the Church of Christ at Northside, and we do consider you as our honored guest. 
And it's our prayer this morning that your visit with us will be strengthening and encouraging and edifying. And that you will want to come back and be with us because you have benefited by being here today. We extend to you an open invitation to all of our activities here at Northside. And wherever you find yourselves able and available, just come on back and be with us as soon and as often as you possibly can. I'm going to ask this morning that you will turn your Bibles with me to the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Colossian Christians. Colossians chapter 2. And meet me at verse number 11. Colossians chapter 2. Verse number 11, and we'll be reading through verse 15. There Paul writes, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. This is the day that most of the world celebrates what is called Easter. But what does that really mean? Because when we look at most of the world, most of the world celebrates Easter with pastel colors and happy children who are out hunting eggs and chocolate. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of those things, especially the chocolate part. Because if you ask my family, I'm probably chocolate's number one fan. And we, we look at... Um, all of this as a happy occasion. But in order to get to the happy occasion, we have to deal with the day that Jesus died. And truth be told, that day had nothing happy in it. Rather, it was a cruel day and a bloody day and a nasty day when Jesus was crucified on Calvary's cross. And crucifixion itself was historically one of the most tortured deaths a person could face. Hours upon hours upon hours of torture. Torture that most of us could not mentally even fathom because the cruelty behind it is not normal. It isn't something that our minds can comprehend. Understand this, crucifixion was not just simply 
a method of death or a method of execution. Because in the torture uh, phase of crucifixion, it was done to keep a person alive and in pain as long as possible. Just keep in mind what Jesus went through that day. He received 39 stripes. Why 39? Because 40 was known to kill a man. They wanted him alive. They pulled out handfuls of his hair and beard by the roots. They wanted him alive. They kicked and punched and spit on him for hours until there was not a single spot on his body not covered in blood or bruises. They wanted him alive. They shoved a crown of thorns on his head so hard that it stuck in his skin. They wanted him alive. And after hours of all of that, they made him walk through the streets of Jerusalem carrying his crossbeam. They made him carry it. A rough piece of wood with splinters digging into his fresh wounds. They wanted him alive. They wanted him to feel every ounce of pain they could bring. But he had to feel it in order to heal us. He could have stopped all of it. He could have called out every single angel from heaven to demolish every person standing and shouting, crucify him. But he didn't. Because Jesus knew that in order to have a resurrection Sunday, you also had to have a crucifixion Friday. He knew that in order to have your joy, you also had to carry your cross. He felt everything that day. He felt how your heart broke wide open when you had to watch your baby die. He felt how heavy your life was. That time you were staring down the barrel of a gun. He carried the burden you carry every since the moment your spouse died and life doesn't seem right without them. On that cross, he held the rapist, he held the murderer, he held the sinner, and he held the saint. He leveled every playing field and said that all of us were worth it. He knew he had to carry that cross. And understand this. He never promised you that the cross that you would carry in this life would not be heavy. His wasn't. What he did promise you, although Friday is here, Sunday is coming. No matter how heavy Friday is, whether it's financially or whether it's emotionally or whether it's mentally, whether it's physically, whether it's spiritually, Friday is heavy. That cross weighs you down. But his promise was simply this, Sunday is coming and you won't have to carry that thing alone. The question begs to be asked this morning, what kind of king would step down from his throne for this? Jesus of Nazareth, the son of God, did it. 
and he simply did it for you and I. We have to look at that thing that he went through called crucifixion. Why did he die? Understand something this morning. There was a custom in the Roman Empire that when a man was condemned for a crime, if he were put into prison, a certificate of debt to the prison would be nailed to the prison door. And on that certificate of debt would be written the crime that this person was guilty of and the amount of time that he would stay in that prison. And once he had fulfilled his duty to the law, his certificate of debt was marked paid in full. And it was given to the judge who would have it notarized and he would carry it with him. And if anybody were to accuse that person of that crime again, he could pull out the certificate of debt and say, yes, I may have been guilty, but I have been paid in full. And you're not going to bring it up again because I've already paid for that crime. If a man was guilty of a capital offense and condemned to die, they would write that offense on the same type of a, a card and nail it to his cross above his head. And, and you remember that's what Pilate did to Jesus above his head. Nailed to the cross was a sign that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And all of this would be a public thing because the authorities wanted people to see that person die in agony. On that cross would be the crime that was committed. And the goal behind all of that would be for people to, when they walk by, they would say, I'll never do that. But in our text this morning, we find that there was something else nailed to the cross of Jesus. Verse 14 speaks of the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. Now, anybody who's ever studied the Bible any amount of time knows that Jesus was sinless. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, him who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us. Christ became sin for us. And from God's point of view, our sin was nailed to the cross. And I want to ask you a question this morning. If it had been you that were on that cross, what could God have said or what could God have put on your card over your head? What would yours say? Would it say murderer? Would it say adulterer? Would it say blasphemer? And I, I know that's not the, the type of things that you would do with your good and holy self. But maybe yours would say liar. Maybe it would say cheater. Maybe it would say gossiper. God could have just simply taken a copy of the Ten Commandments and nailed them over our heads because we are as guilty of the death of Christ as if we had driven the spikes into his wrist personally. Yes, he willingly died. But he died for and he died because of you and because of me. And what a blessing to think that Jesus knew me. Yet he loved me enough to go to the cross anyway. Romans 5 and 8 tells us very plainly, for God commended his love toward us. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Aren't you glad? For the cross of Jesus. 
we would be nothing without him and his sacrifice on Calvary. He is the way, the truth, and the light. No man cometh to the Father but by him. And the salvation that we enjoy and that we speak of all the time costs a great price. Now, now it was free to you. It was free to me. But it cost Jesus a great price, and he paid it at the cross. And while we're at that, let me just say that, that that debt was your debt, and that debt was my debt. And it was paid in full. And though times have changed, and though the blood is often ignored, and though the cross is watered down in our, our modern times, it is still the cross. And it's the cross that I want us to think about this morning as we deal with the subject, what happened at the cross? What happened at the cross? When we think about all that Christ has done for us, and when we consider those things that are yet to come, we have to remember the cost of the cross. We have to remember what happened on that day. And the first thing Paul lets us know here that happened that day was that our lives were transformed. Our lives were transformed. Look again at verses 11 and 12. He says this, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. First of all, you see there, there's a process of this transformation. Paul lets us know that when we came to Christ, we were circumcised. Now, circumcision was a very important thing to the Jewish community. In fact, that was the way that a person would identify themselves with God. And it was so important that every Jewish boy at the ripe age of eight days old would be taken to the priest to be circumcised. And that mark of circumcision would simply show that I'm one of God's. I identify with God. Now, Paul lets us know that we were circumcised. Now, now, I don't want you to get it mixed up because it's not a physical thing. First of all, because women can come to Christ, but they can't be circumcised like men were. Paul lets us know that this circumcision was not a physical thing, but a spiritual thing. Christ here performs a spiritual circumcision and he does it by cutting away our sinful nature and I want you to keep in mind here as we look at this thing that is it is Christ who performs this procedure it's not you you know why because you can't do it See, too many people are trying to clean themselves up. And when we talk about cleaning ourselves up, we talk about breaking certain bad habits and stop doing certain sinful things and, and stopping going to bad places and all of that. You can do all of that. And your sin nature will just be as nasty as it was before. You can't do it. It took Christ to perform that spiritual circumcision. It took Christ to cut away 
your sinful nature. And there's a process behind it. Uh, 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 Paul refers to it in Romans 2 and 29 as circumcision of the heart. You went through some heart surgery. And it was done in a special way. Now, they didn't take you over to Henry Ford Hospital or Beaumont Hospital or whatever the choice hospital you want to go to. Paul says it like this. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. I want you to consider a similar verse. Romans 6, 4, Paul says it like this. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Christ performed open heart surgery on you to cut away the sinful nature of your heart and then raise you back up from your dead life into a newness of life in him. Understand that before Christ, you were dead. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Yeah, there might have been blood pumping through your veins. Yes, you might have been breathing in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide. Yes, your heart was still probably pumping about 70 times a minute. But you were just as dead as dead could be. Before Christ. But Paul lets us know in baptism we were buried. You know that everything that dies needs to be buried. And then he says we were raised to walk in newness of life. And the result of this transformation that happened at the cross is simply this. We have gone, we have been transformed from death unto life. The question I want to ask you this morning is simply this. Have you experienced that new life? Now, now, I'm not asking you if you've come to the altar and had some emotional experience. I'm asking you, have you had a conversion experience, a transformation experience? And if you have, you can trace it back to the cross. But not only at the cross were our lives transformed, Paul also lets us know that at the cross our souls were saved. Look at verse 13. He says, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, just like I said a moment ago, because of sin, we were dead. Before Christ, our sinful nature had not been removed. But Paul here lets us know that God has quickened us together with him. That phrase there literally means that he has raised you up and made you alive. Simply put, he saved us. But, but, but what does that really mean? When you were lost and you were headed for hell, through his love and his mercy and his grace, Jesus rescued you. And I want you to know simply what the results are of that rescue action. First of all, your sin is forgiven. Isaiah 38 and 17 says it like this. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Your sins were forgiven at the cross. 
What else happened there? You became a child of Almighty God. John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew not him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be like. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. You became God's son. You became God's daughter at the cross. What else happened? You became a joint heir with Christ. Romans 8 and 17, Paul says this, And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. You became a joint heir at the cross. There's so much more. You were delivered from the power of sin at the cross. You were promised eternal life at the cross. You were provided a home in heaven at the cross. You were uh, given a personal relationship with Jesus at the cross. We were saved and we were changed at the cross. But as we move deeper into the text, we'll see not only were our lives transformed and our souls saved, Paul also lets us know thirdly at the cross our debt was paid. Look at verses 13 and 14 with me again. He says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Did you see that? There were some things there that show that you had a debt, that you had something that you could not deal with. First of all, he forgave you all of your trespasses. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances and I, I just need to say something about this debt that was paid. First of all, consider the source of the payment and also the scope of the payment. He lets us know that God paid the ransom. And that's just amazing to me. God paid the ransom to save lost sinners like you and me. Just like you couldn't make yourself clean, you could not pay the sin debt either. But Jesus did. And I want you to see the scope of this. Paul says he forgave all sin. Look at it again in verse number 13. Having forgiven you all trespasses. I don't know what you've done in life. I don't know how bad you might have been in life. I don't know all of the various sins you may have committed in your life. I do know this. There's not a one that was not covered at the cross. I just love it how the song goes, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He paid our debt. He endured our punishment. He nailed it all to the cross. My sin was buried when he was buried, and my sin debt is paid in full. 
Paul says it like this over in Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You know what that means? Nobody can rightfully accuse you of anything. Nobody can rightfully condemn you of anything. The only one in history who could have ever condemned us was God himself. But God now counts us righteous. And when periods of doubt enter your mind, I just want you to remember something. You are justified by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that word justified, I need you to understand something there. Justified doesn't mean that you weren't guilty. Justified doesn't mean that you didn't do it. Yeah, we all did it. Paul lets us know that we all have sinned. And we all have fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah, you did it and I did it too. But that word justified simply means this. Yeah, the judge knows that we did it. But he chooses us or chooses to treat us as if we didn't do it, as if we're not guilty. He says, yeah, you are guilty. Yeah, you did whatever it was. But I'm going to treat you otherwise. That was your point to shout right there. Because if he had not treated you as justified, that would have been you hanging on Golgotha's cross. We possess a certificate of debt. And on that certificate of debt is written in the blood of Jesus, paid in full. At the cross, what happened? Our lives were transformed, our souls were saved, and our debt is paid. But there was one more thing that happened there at that cross that Friday morning. At the cross, our enemy was defeated. Paul says this in verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. When Paul talks about this thing, principalities and powers, what is he talking about? He's talking simply about the power of Satan. Ephesians 6 and 12, he lets us know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. See, see, your struggle ain't with the person sitting on the pew next to you. Your real struggle ain't your boss at work. Your real struggle ain't the ungodly government that some of us like to refer to it as. Your real struggle ain't with the police. Your struggle ain't with your wife or your husband or your kids. Your real struggle is with Satan himself. That's the enemy. And Satan not only was your enemy, but he also tried to destroy Christ as well. But his plan backfired. The Hebrew writer says this over in Hebrews 2 and 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Jesus at the cross took out the enemy. He destroyed the power of Satan. And that word destroyed is an interesting word when we look at it in the Greek language. It's the word katageo. 
and it means simply to make of none effect. Now, 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 that doesn't mean that he's been obliterated. Satan is still around. And Satan's going to be around to the end of time. But what it does mean is that Satan has been made of none effect. Satan doesn't have the power over you like he once did because Jesus took that power and just stomped all over it at the cross. And on that Friday morning, it, when it appeared that all was lost and they took him down from the cross, it, 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 it might have appeared to some that Satan had won the fight. But on that Sunday morning, Jesus walked out of that grave alive from the dead. God had raised him just like he promised. Satan at that moment had lost everything. John says it this way in 1 John 3 and 8, for the purposes the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. We, while we have to endure Satan's presence, we don't have to be overcome by his power. Rest assured that Christ defeated Satan, and because of this, we have the victory. And all of that defeat can be traced right back to that same place, the cross. If you are saved, then you can be rest assured that your, your, your life was transformed and your soul was saved and your debt was paid and your enemy was defeated. But there's also something else about those who experienced all of those things at the cross. I'm going to close out with this thing. Jesus didn't save you at the cross for you to keep that good news to yourself. Jesus didn't save you at the cross for you to take what he's done for you and put it in some lockbox somewhere and never share that information with anybody. It was so important to you that he meant for you to go out and tell somebody about what he's done, about what he'd accomplished at the cross. Think about it for a moment. You go back to that Sunday morning when the gospel writers talked about the women who had went to the, to the tomb to, sh uh, to, to, to uh, embalm anoint the body one last time and they got to the tomb and they found that the tomb was empty and the stone had been rolled away and the angel there that was at the tomb said this why are you seeking the living among the dead he is not here he is risen what did those women do they immediately went and told folk that Jesus was back, that he was alive. Problem is, some of us operate like he's still in the tomb, that he's still dead. Matter of fact, we act worse than that. We, we talk about dead folk all the time. My father's been gone 18 years, and I still talk about him like he was the greatest man ever to live. And if I could talk that way about him, and you have folk just like that that you talk about in your life, how much more should you be talking about Jesus who ain't in the grave no more? My father was great. 
but he's still down there at Elmwood Cemetery, or his remains are. You've got somebody in your life who was great, who may have passed on. Wherever they were buried or wherever they, uh, or when they were cremated, wherever their ashes was, they're still there. And come this time next year, they'll still be there. And the following year, they'll still be there. And until Jesus comes back for us, they will still be there. But Jesus got up out that grave, never to go to another grave again. We can't even say that about the folk he brought back from the dead. John 11, Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead after he had been dead four days. Let me ask you a question. Where do you think Lazarus is right now? Dead. Jesus interrupted a funeral procession in the Gospel of Luke uh, and brought back the, 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 the only son of a widow. Where do you think he is now? Dead. All of the folk that the apostles brought back, all of the folk that the prophets brought, dead. Jesus is the only one. And we ought to be spreading that news everywhere we go. Because we are the only folk Followers of Jesus are the only folk who serve a risen Lord. Who are you telling? What are you doing with that news? I remember when we were kids, we used to sing a song, I've got the joy of Jesus in my heart. That's a good place for it to be. But guess what? It also ought to be coming out of your mouth. It also ought to be shared with folk who might not have that joy right now. That I serve a risen Savior. who's done all of this for me. And he did it at the cross. And just like he did all of that for me at the cross, he can do it for you too. He can transform your life. He can save your soul. He can pay your debt. And he's already defeated your enemy. All at the cross. That's the real reason for our joy at the cross. While that Friday looked just so dark and dim, we now get to experience the Sunday. the hope of Sunday because of the darkness of Friday. And whatever you're going through right now, just consider that Sunday's coming. Sunday's here. I bet you didn't even realize that your Friday and your Sunday could exist at the same time. That simply means that whatever it is that you're dealing with, whatever it is that you're going through, Jesus is already taking care of it. Whatever that you're facing, he's already dealt with it and he's already moved on to the next thing that you're going to face later on.
you can be walking in your Sunday, although it even feels like Friday. But your hope has to be in what was done at the cross. Where are you this morning? If you're already a child of God and you're going through some things, you, you, your life is just knocking you around, beating you up. Just keep in mind, Sunday is already here. A great theologian once said, the electrifying mojo. Just tie a knot and hang on. Because Sunday's already here. Put whatever it is that you're going through in the hands of God and watch what he can do if you would just have faith in him to bring you through it. If you find yourself as a child of God mired in sin again, Keep in mind what was done at the cross wasn't a one-time thing in your life. John lets us plainly know that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And he was talking to Christians. He was already talking to folk who had already been to the cross. Understand something, you need the cross in perpetuity. You're going to need the cross. You're going to need what was done at the cross every day of your life. And I'm talking about every one of us. So don't, make, don't let nobody make you feel guilty about you falling into sin. Because that's simply the guilty accusing the guilty. They need the cross just like you do. If you're not a child of God this morning, you can be one right now because of what happened at the cross. So part of what was done at the cross was to bridge that gulf between God and man. Long before Jesus came to earth, that prophet Isaiah said this, your sin have separated you from God. In other words, God never left us. We left him. And it was our sins that drove us to walk away from God. But Jesus came to, to, to bring that gap closer to where we could be with God again. Because that's the only place that we're going to find hope, that we're going to find peace, that we're going to find salvation, that we're going to find forgiveness, that we're going to find justification, that we're going to find sanctification, that we're going to find redemption, whatever it is. Only place you're going to find it is with God. That's why Jesus had to come and die. So that we could get back to God. He's already done his part. The cross has already taken place. All he wants you to do is to accept what was done. And apply it to your life. How do I do that, Brother Preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked. First of all, you need to believe what you just heard. You need to have faith that Jesus came and that he died for you. Yeah, I, I know he came and he died for the whole world. I know that John tells me, John 3 and 16 says, for God so loved the world, but ignore all of that right now. He came to die for you. You're part of the world, right? 
believe that. Let that belief lead you to repentance. It's your turnaround. It's your change. It's a change of heart and a change of mind that results in a change of direction and a change of attitude. You leave that old sinful man behind of all of its deeds, and now you turn to Christ. Let it lead you to confession. And that word confession simply means that you stand in agreement with. You stand in agreement with God that you were a sinner and you were in need of a Savior. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to save you. And let it lead you to baptism. That's where that operation we talked about took place. The circumcision of your heart. Your sinful nature being cut away. The blood of Jesus being applied to you. Washing all of your sins away. Making you a new creature in him. What's your decision this morning? Is it a decision for Christ? Is it a decision to come back to Christ? Is it a decision to trust him and place yourself, your life, everything about you in his hand? What's your decision? Let it be known right now. As we sing the song of invitation, won't you stand and come right now to Jesus? Amen. He comes, he lives, he lives, I can face, face to my
Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. For I received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he take the bread and break it, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This is the New Testament, this cup, rather, is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let every man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we humbly approach your throne of grace, Father, ready to remember your Son and his sacrifice on the cross, Father, as we take these symbols of his broken body and shed blood, Father. Let us remember that everything that we are and everything that we have is because of you. And let us do so with a glad heart, Father, ready to be able to go out, Father, and just explain the good news of Jesus Christ to all. In your Son's name and the Holy Spirit's name, we pray. Amen. Now let us always remember that it is more blessed to give than to receive, for the Father does love a cheerful giver. If you are here in the audience and you feel compelled to give back just a portion and you want to do it with cash or check, you can leave it with uh, Chris at the back. And if you are in the digital space, we have several ways to give which appear on your television right now. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us just, Father, to demonstrate our love and our obedience, Father, by giving back just a portion, Father, of what you have blessed us with. We ask, Father, that all the contributions be used for the edification and the benevolence of the church. And we pray, Father, that everything that has been done be done in a a manner that is pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, the Spirit's name, in your name we pray so. Also, amen. Thank you. 
land of bondage with earthly treasures. Oh, and I'll turn it into a place where there is love on every hand. I'll exchange a land of heartaches for a land of pleasure. For I'm a girl that I can't be. Cause Canaan's happy land. Everybody sing. thankful this morning for all of the blessings that you have so graciously bestowed upon us. We're thankful for this opportunity that we've had to come together to celebrate you, to worship you, to praise you. And Father God, we pray that our, our worship to you has been in accordance with your will, and if not, we ask your forgiveness. Father God, we pray right now that as we depart from this place, that we will never depart from your presence that you will always be watchful over us and protective over us until the next time we come together again in your name. We pray it right now in the name of Jesus. Amen.